right, welcome to our lecture on why business services tend to cluster in larger settlements. The slides were designed to accompany the textbook, The Cultural Landscape. I am Ms. Dahl, and I'll be your uh, host for the lecture. So, something to kind of start out looking at, remember when we talk about urban settlements, there's a couple of different ways to classify countries based on their urban settlements, right? We've got the rank size rule, and then we've also got the primate city system. Rank size rule, remember, states that a <clears throat> city's population is inversely proportional to its place in the urban hierarchy. So let me give you an example. Right. New York is the most populated city in the United States. Chicago is about the third most populated city in the United States. The population of Chicago should be approximately one-third the population of New York. That's how the rank size rule works. If you look at our graphic here, you can see that the U.S. and also that uh, Indonesia, they follow this really pretty reasonably well. Not every place does. Places that don't follow the rank size rule fall into the primate city category. And primate cities are cities whose populations are greater than two times the, lar um, the size of the largest, next largest settlement. And, and this is an important distinction, and the primate city dominates the economic, cultural, and often political life of the country. So you got to have both the size piece and the importance piece for it to be a primate city. So when we start talking about business services, remember we need to talk about different types, right? We um, look at services whether we're in world cities or really whether we're in um, we're in any other city we're going to classify them into three we're going to classify services into three basic categories right business services and the clustering of business services is largely a product of the industrial revolution and business services are literally service industries that grow up to support other businesses these are um, Things like the guy who comes in to repair the copier at an office, right? And that's a business service. Consumer services are retail services that generally have extensive market areas. Okay. Um, they may include leisure services, especially if they're of national importance because of large thresholds, large ranges, um, the presence of wealthy patrons and the like. Okay. Threshold, remember, is uh, how many people you need to support a given service, range is how far people will travel to utilize a given service, and a patron is really just somebody who kind of helps pay for or underwrite something. And then there's also our third major category of services are public services. And when we're talking about world cities in particular, these are often the center of national or international political power of some sort. Right, so Tokyo, Japan is a source of national political power. We wanted to talk about um, London, England. It's a source of national political power. It's also a source of, much like Tokyo, economic power. New York City, on the other hand, is not a source of national political power, but it is a source of international economic power in the United States. And if we wanted to look what's a city that's a source of international political power, we'd be talking about potentially Washington, D.C. or Brussels. Right, those places where there's lots of um, international wrangling kind of going on between countries. I guess, New I guess New York would fit into that category since the UN is there as well, now that I stop and think about it a little more. So, <coughs> sorry about that, pardon me. <coughs> Just to give you a map and talk about what are kind of the major world cities, you do for sure need to know those three dominant world cities. You need to know New York, you need to know London, you need to know Tokyo. <clears throat> those secondary cities, not as important to know. And these are places like LA, Chicago, Washington DC, Paris, Singapore. They're important. They're not as important. <clears throat> okay. And then those secondary cities, for sure, you don't need to know. It's nice to kind of know where they are, and I would expect, for example, that you know that Seoul is in Korea, although on this map they've got it in the wrong Korea. Um, that Hong Kong 
is in China, that Bangkok is in Thailand, and the like. So you should know approximately where to find them. You may not necessarily remember all of their names, and that's okay. That's okay. So, when we start to talk about businesses in less developed countries, uh, what's really interesting when we talk about business services in less developed countries is that they tend to really fall under two major functions, right? They're either financial services or they're back offices. And with financial services, major companies are looking for two basic key things. One is they're looking for tax breaks. Okay, so they want to lower their tax bill. And two is that they're looking for privacy. They want places that are not going to pry into what's going on too badly. We're talking about offshore financial services. Okay, they want places that are going to guarantee their privacy. We talk about back office functions. These are um, things like, for example, uh, call centers. It's a great example of a back office function. Uh, I went into the urgent care not too long ago because I had pneumonia. They took an x-ray of my chest. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that it was some radiologist in India who actually looked at it or someplace similar, right? Um, that's a back office function. It's things that they can send out because they're, they need to be able to do them, but they're not, um, interacting with customers directly. Okay. LDCs are attractive for these kinds of things because of low wages. Right? That's a huge draw. And then also what do companies look for? They look for the ability to speak English. This is what makes India such an attractive place for back office functions because there's low wages, they speak very good English, and it's reasonably easy to train them because they already speak English to speak it without as much of an accent. Okay, so, um, which works really well when we're talking about things like uh, phone service, or uh, call center, sorry. <clears throat> so, moving on though, because I've got a lot of slides to get through and not a ton of time. We talk about the economic basis of settlements. Okay, there's really two types of industries within a settlement. We've got our basic industries, and these are the ones that send what they're doing outside of the settlement. Okay? Um, these are Boeing, for example, we live in the Seattle area, right? That's a basic industry. Microsoft is a basic industry, where the bulk of what they do, they send out of the area. It doesn't tend to stay here. Non-basic industries, on the other hand, they grow up to support those basic industries. So the example I was giving a kid in class the other day is um, there's a fa there's a Boeing factory in Auburn, right? Boeing is a basic industry, but then the restaurants that spring up around there or the, the gyms and things like that that spring up along there to service those folks who work at the Boeing factory, those are non-basic industries. Okay, so what they're doing is staying in the community. And what you see when we look across the globe is that different cities tend to specialize in different types of services. Right? So if we talk about San Francisco, for example, San Francisco specializes in information services. They specialize in business-based services, right? We talk about Seattle. Seattle's got a few different specialties, but certainly when we're talking about services, we've got some broad categories, information services and medical services, right, are what we tend to focus focus on up here. And with that, and this kind of makes sense, what ends up happening is that talent distributes itself to those places, right? We do a lot of biomedical research around here, so not surprisingly, doctors tend to flock, especially doctors who want to do research, tend to flock to Seattle, right? Programmers who want to break into programming and work for big companies or want to break into, in particular, mobile apps flock to San Francisco because that's where the businesses are that can support them and that can provide them jobs and things. So if we look, for instance, at the United States, and we look at our map here, and this is kind of a fun map because it's got all kinds of funky symbols, Right, that blue kind of staircasey, I guess it's probably supposed to be a cash reg an old school cash register kind of thing. For instance, it's around say Yakima and roughly Spokanish. Well, 
that's the wholesale trade. The um, the funny cart thing right there that's kind of around Walla Walla thereabouts, that's mining. Those state capitol buildings that's around Olympia and Salem, Oregon, that, not surprisingly, is government. They are public services. You can kind of see when you look at the West, there's not quite as much of an economic base in a lot of areas. Because, for instance, if we look at, um, say, uh, the Four Corners region, right? Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and uh, Utah. There's most of what goes on there in terms of economic activity tends to be more agricultural. Right? There's not as much, and there's quite frankly not as many people in those areas, except for in certain areas of Colorado or certain areas. Right? Each one's got its big city or two of those four states, but not as much. Right? If we look at, say, uh, the East Coast, though, where there's a lot more people, you can see there's a lot more specialization going on in different cities. Right? And you can see where those specializations tend to cluster. Right? Manufacturing durable goods, for example, clusters right up north by the Great Lakes. Non-durable goods, kind of in the south, the northern part of the southeast, by roughly by the ocean. Okay, so you can kind of see how these things agglomerate and how they build on each other. We're going to move on and look at our next map here, which actually, oh, I'm doing really good on time, uh, is our last map to talk about the geography of talent. And this, I think, is kind of a fun map. We look at where do the scientists go, for example. Not surprisingly, right? 20 to 30 scientists per 1,000 up in the Seattle area, right? We look at um, other areas that are ranking really high. We can see right um, in Maryland. I mean, I guess that's somewhere near Baltimore and Johns Hopkins, for example, right? Um, but we can see where there's there's still more on the East Coast, which makes sense because there's more people there. But you can see certain areas tend to have more. We look at the map right below that, we talk about professionals. And professionals are people, by the way, who um, have a, a post-secondary degree is usually the way it's categorized. So some kind of a graduate degree in some field. All right? Again, Seattle, 240 to 320 per 1,000 per 1, professionals. Not bad. Southern California, not surprisingly, ranks right in that same area. Right? And I would guess, based on looking at that dot, that's either San Diego or San Francisco. <clears throat> you can see, again, East Coast still more, but they also tend to be clustered. That um, megalopolis area, right from really New York City down to Washington, D.C., there's a bunch of major cities in there. And you can see where they're kind of starting, where they kind of cluster all together, follow the curve of that, right? You can see some kind of in the western part of the Midwest. The same thing. If we look at university graduates, I think actually this data is a little out of date when I look at the Seattle number, mostly just because Seattle tends to have a very high percentage of uh, graduates, and this one would indicate that it didn't which is not strictly true, but 20 to 30 percent of uh, people in Seattle, according to this map at least, have university degrees. So that means they've got a four-year degree. Right? Again, that same curve is evident in the megalopolis region on the East Coast. Other cities, not surprisingly, we could point to a few. Another trend that I'm seeing as I look across these maps is that upper part of the Midwest, that Montana, Dakotas, Wyoming, kind of region right there, right? Nebraska. You'll notice in if you look at all six maps, no dots are there. But it's not to say that these these folks don't have these things. But I, what it's really more reflective of is the number of people they have. Okay. Oh, I just looked at my clock and realized how quickly time's running out. See similar patterns if we look at coolness, if we look at gaze, if we look at cultural amenities. Right. Just to wrap up, what we've been talking about is where we would find specific types of businesses, what the different types of businesses are. If you have any questions, please feel free to come see me during class, and I'd be delighted to answer whatever questions you have.